uh, our next speaker uh, joins us from Freelton, <laughs> uh, yeah. Brian Samus. Uh, he's a solutions architect at uh, AWS, and he's going to give us a technical deep dive into the new AWS EC2 VT1 instances, uh, the first cloud instances designed from the ground up to accelerate video transcoding workflows. So take it away, Brian. Oh, sorry. Hang, hang on just a second. Apparently, I need to. Uh, apparently, I need to authorize all sorts of permissions in order to share my screen. The joy of IT security. Oh, it says I have to quit and reopen Chime. So I'll be right back. Just give me two seconds. This would be a good time to play some elevator music, um, get people in the mood to, to learn about, <laughs> to digest that, uh, that deep dive into, oh, try to admit them. The deep dive into ADQT and other quality metrics. Oh, well, Brian, can't hear you, you did through Google Meet. Can you hear me now? now? Yeah. All right, cool. Uh, so you can hear me and you can see my screen. Yes. All right, we are we are rolling then. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm just going to dive right in. Uh, feel free to ask questions either along the way or at the end or, or whatever. Uh, I'm not, uh, not too formal about all this. Um, so my name is Brian Samus. I'm a senior specialized solutions architect with AWS. Um, I am based here in the Toronto-ish general, greater Hamilton, Toronto, Kitchener-Waterloo area. Um, I, uh, uh, I, I started my career actually in the Toronto area. I worked at Rogers as a video engineer for uh, six years, I think, uh, back in the uh, late uh, 2010s. Um, and then uh, I spent uh, about six years uh, in Denver, Colorado, working with a uh, startup with uh, doing some video encoding stuff at, at Comcast out there. Uh, and then uh, I joined AWS in 2016 and have, have been part of the uh, media and entertainment and uh, media services team within AWS since then. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit today about the uh, the new Amazon EC2 VT1 instances that uh, we just launched that, G, uh, G, I think it was about two weeks ago, maybe it was even one week ago. Um, and these are the uh, kind of the first cloud instances that have been built, uh, purpose-built specifically just for video transcoding and for absolutely nothing else. Uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about kind of what's going on behind uh, behind the scenes and, and how it's working and what, what their capabilities are. So the first question is, uh, why did we build uh, an EC2 instance just for transcoding? Um, and what it comes down to is that, you know, we speak to a lot of customers who do video streaming at, at very large scale. Um, and, you know, Twitch is a great example. And almost all people who deal with a large scale of video streams have, you know, what we typically call in the industry, like the, you know, the 90-10 problem or the 80-20 problem, which is that, you know, 10% of your content is viewed by 90% of your viewers, uh, or, you know, 20% of your content is viewed by 80% of your viewers, or usually it's some sort of split like that, where, you know, you have a very kind of small uh, portion of your streams or of your library that's accounting for the majority of your viewership and, and thus the majority of your revenue. Um, so the challenge that a lot of companies like that face is how can they support that longer tail of content, you know, the, the thousands or tens of thousands of, of, you know, broadcasters or videos that don't get watched a whole lot and you don't make a whole lot of money of uh, from, but, you know, you still want to provide those broadcasters and those viewers with a good quality of experience, uh, you know, in kind of the most cost effective way possible. Um, so we kind of took this problem and chewed on it for a little bit and talked to some of our hardware partners um, and came up with the concept of a VT1 instance, which is, you know, purpose-built to solve this specific problem. It's basically purpose-built to encode uh, lots of video really fast and really cheap. Uh, and uh, this is kind of what, what we came up with. Um, so the VT1 instances uh, are EC2 instances that you can spin up in the cloud, just like any other type of EC2 instance. Uh, they can they feature up to eight Xilinx Alveo U30 Media Accelerator cards. 
so we're going to dive a little bit deeper into what exactly those cards are and, and how they work. But uh, basically, they're uh, uh, they're cards that have you know uh, FPGA as as well as uh, uh, video accelerator uh, capabilities on them that focus on specific tasks like decoding, encoding, resizing, you know, those sorts of things that are done typically in, as part of these video encoding workflows. Um, again, they're purpose built just for video transcoding. So, you know, you can certainly do anything that you can do on a CPU instance with a VT1, but you would kind of be silly to do that because uh, really, you know, the reason that you're buying these instances or using these instances is for those media accelerator cards. Um, and what we've seen in testing is that uh, using these VT1 instances, we're able to get about 30% better price per stream uh, than what we can do with NVENC on the latest generation NVIDIA GPU instances, uh, and about 60% better price per stream than what you can get with uh, X264 or X265 on the latest uh, Intel AMD or ARM based instances. Uh, and that's, you know, obviously kind of at a, at a similar video quality where, where we're comparing those densities. Um, you can launch VT1 instances uh, in containerized workflows. So there's full support for Amazon EC, uh, ECS as well as EKS for Kubernetes. Uh, so your applications within those containers can actually access uh, all of the accelerator hardware uh, within the host. Um, and we're going to be launching on-premises deployments in AWS outposts coming soon. So you'll be able to, you know, essentially get an entire rack of instances full of these cards and, and you know, transcodes uh, hundreds or thousands of, of, of channels all at once. So these instances, uh, in addition to the, uh, the media accelerator cards, they have the Intel Xeon Cascade Lake processors with up to 192 gigs of RAM, uh, 25 gigabit per second networking, and uh, 19 gigabits per second of dedicated EBS bandwidth. So let's dive a little bit further in. So these are kind of what the, uh, the core encoding capabilities are of these, uh, uh, of these instances. Um, and these numbers, we're going to... Uh, we're going to dive a little bit deeper into these numbers in, in a couple of slides, uh, but keep in mind that these numbers, these quantities, are uh, per chip, not uh, not per instance. And each instance will have you know x number of chips depending on the instance size. Um, so basically, these these instances are capable of doing hardware accelerated encoding and decoding of both H.264 and H.265. Uh, they can both do, uh, you know, up to one 4K P60 per chip, uh, and then, you know, it, it kind of varies in terms of like, you know, you, you can you can uh, divvy up the capacity of, of each chip based on, you know, the one 4K P60 in terms of kind of the pixels per second that it can encode. Uh, so you can you can say, okay, I could, you know, encode one uh, K four P, uh, sorry, one 4K P60 or two 4K P30s or maybe one 4K P30 and, you know, two 1080 P60s, you know, you can kind of dice it up that way. But it, basically what the, the limiting factor is, is essentially the number of, of pixels per second that can be processed by, by the card. Uh, currently, we only support 8-bit uh, encoding on, uh, on these chips. Uh, however, uh, I believe 10-bit support is in the pipeline to, to be launching uh, uh, potentially later this year and, and you know, hopefully uh, before the beginning of next year. Uh, they only support 420 encoding. So these are really kind of intended for distribution, you know, like volume distribution of content. They're not encoded for like, mez uh, they're not intended for like mezzanine encoding or high quality encoding. Um, Oh, I see we have a question. Go ahead, Abdul. Uh, so ATVC encoding is almost as uh, dense as H.264. So what's the trick? Uh, the trick is it's all being done in hardware. Uh, so basically, the, 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 the pixel capacity of, of what's being encoded uh, is, is kind of codec irrelevant. It, 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 it's agnostic because uh, it, was, it was built for H.265 encoding, and then we're basically doing the uh, uh, the same thing for H.264. So I'm I'm going to dive a little bit into the architecture of the chip in a couple of slides, so we can uh, we can kind of cover that in a bit more detail. But uh, basically, all of this is being done in hardware, and it was built, you know, to have this capacity for H.265 encoding, um, and then, you know, that kind of translates over to H.264 as well, if if that makes sense. Yeah. So more chip area. Yeah. In other words. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Um, and uh, you know, with H.264, we can support uh, baseline main and high. And with H.265, we can do main and main intra. Uh, and compared to video quality, so this is important. Um, 
the video quality, there, there aren't a lot of knobs you can turn because this is like a really kind of purpose-built accelerated hardware thing here. So you can adjust certain VQ settings, like you can adjust uh, some of the GOPs and some of the, you know, the, the pre-filtering and the bit rates and, and those sorts of things. Um, but the, you don't have a ton of control over over the VQ with, with, these, with these cards. So uh, in the testing that we've done, we found that to be roughly equivalent in VQ to the faster uh, presets that are available in X264 or X265. Um, so again, you know, these are not intended for like, you know, getting HBO plus, you know, on the air to watch Game of Thrones or something like that. Uh, these are really kind of more intended for use cases where you have a high volume of video that you want to encode cheaply. So that would be things like user generated content, uh, IOT, security camera footage, you know, those those sorts of things where you have lots of stuff and, and you're, you know, not as not as important to, to encode it with, with the best quality. Um, a couple of other kind of limitations. So uh, we support uh, progressive encoding only. So there's no interlaced support uh, at, at this time on the hardware acceleration. Uh, you can encode resolutions from 128 by 128 all the way up to, uh, to 4K or UHD. Um, and there's only three uh, supported rate control modes. So you can do CBR, VBR, or constant QP. Uh, so there's no you know, CRF or, or anything like that uh, available on, on this card. Uh, it's basically just you know, constant bit rate, variable bit rate, or uh, the constant quantization parameters. So what, is, you know, what, what does it look like on the inside? So basically, uh, the U30 card is, is a PCIe card that we have kind of sitting inside these, these servers in some sort of mystery Amazon data center somewhere. And uh, each of these cards has what we call two XCU30 chips on them. Um, these XCU30 chips, uh, we can zoom in a little bit on that. So this is kind of the, the block diagram of, of the card itself. Um, and each of these XCU30 chips basically uh, has, you know, a, 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 an FPGA kind of fabric where it's actually doing the, uh, the audio encoding and decoding. Um, and then it also has a general purpose quad core ARM processor where we're doing some other, uh, some other functions. And each of these uh, chips, even though they're on the same card, are basically independently addressable because they're using PCIe bifurcation. So you can actually uh, address each of those cards and uh, each of those chips uh, and, and treat them kind of independently, even though they're on the same host card together. Um, and the things you can do in hardware on these cards is basically there's dedicated hardware engines for decoding, again, H.264 and H.265 only. Uh, there's dedicated hardware for encoding for H.264 and H.265. Um, these cards do support a, uh, a hardware look-ahead engine to improve video quality. Uh, that only works currently for up to 1080p60, uh, and we are looking to add 4K support uh, for look-ahead coming, coming soon. Uh, and you can also do uh, scaling and resizing on the, uh, on the hardware as well. Uh, the only limitation there is, uh, you know, I mentioned before, 128 by 128 at the low end, all the way up to 4K. Uh, with, uh, I, th I think they have to be a multiple of four as well for, for any, any of the resolutions. Uh, yeah, Chris, go ahead. Um, for non-264 and 265 codecs to do transcoding, mm -hmm. can you transcode in software and then memory mapped into the hardware space to do the hardware encode? Yeah, ab absolutely. So you can, um, you know, if, if you've got like a ProRes file or, uh, you know, an AV1 or VP9 or something like that, uh, you can absolutely decode it in, you know, on the CPU and then pass it to the, uh, uh, to the accelerator to do the encoding. Obviously, you're not going to necessarily get the same density numbers if you do it that way, just because you'll probably run out of CPU cycles before you run out of uh, encode capability. Um, but you certainly can do that, yeah. Okay, um, so, um the, it, it, sorry, uh, the H.264 or H.265 decode is supported because it comes for free since you have to decode as part of encoding? Uh, it, it, it's, not, it's, it's, it's not coming for free. There actually are separate resources for decoding that are on the, uh, on the card. Uh, so mm -hmm. there's, there's actually a command you can run there. So there's both the C API for the card as well as the, a set of utilities that Xilinx provides. Um, so while you're running like a transcode job, you can actually run this command, which will show you what the resource utilization on the card is. Um, and you'll actually see that there's a separate, you know, resource for, for decoding as, as there is for encoding. And they're kind of, uh, you, you know, you'll see them, you know, moving differently depending on how many resources you're consuming for each of them. Uh, so okay. the short so answer is them in parallel. 
yes, you, you can do them in parallel. And if you're doing a standard transcode, you'll be using you know one decode slot and one encode slot. Uh, but you can use them independently as well if, if you prefer to. You can do a decode only or you can do an encode only in, with the acceleration. Okay, got it. Um, so this is what you know. each of these chips, I mentioned each card has two chips. Each chip has the capability to do either one 4K P60, uh, two 4K P30s, four 1080p 60s, eight uh, 1080p 30s, or 16 720p 30s. And you can also kind of keep extrapolating that down to you know the lower resolutions. Uh, again, the limitation really is just kind of in the number of pixels per second that can be encoded and decoded by, by each of these resources. Um, there's also, uh, you know, limitations for uh, for scaling. So if you want to do scaling for adaptive bitrate streaming, um, you can, for example, take a, you know, I'll take the second from the bottom line here. You can take a 1080p60, uh, and you can encode, say, a 1080p60, 720p60, 720p30, 480p30, blah blah blah, so on and so forth, to create, you know, your full ABR stack. Um, and if you're creating that stack, you know, on the card, you can do uh, four of these per uh, per card, so basically two of them per chip. Um, and you can kind of visualize the, uh, the, the, you know, the scaling as, as kind of by looking at this diagram again. So let's say, for example, you know, you wanted to create an adaptive bitrate stack that had, a, you know, a 1080p60, a 1080p30, and two 720p30s. You can kind of, you know, look at this and say, uh, you know, we, we have, uh, you know, one 1080p60, one 1080p30, and two 720p30s. Uh, so all of that accounts for basically half of a chip. So you could do two of those workloads per chip. Um, and all of this documentation, by the way, is is public. So, uh, uh, you know, if, if if you miss anything in this presentation, you know, you can get it all with, within our documentation's pages. Um, so basically, these EC2 VT1 instances are available in three different sizes. Uh, the VT1 3x large gets you one U30 card, uh, which of course gives you two of the XU30 chips. Um, the 6x large gets you two cards or four chips, and the 24 extra large gets you eight cards or 16 chips. Um, so you can imagine, you know, the the density here is is actually pretty impressive. Like for example, you know, the the VT1 3x large, uh, these go for in US East One, which is the North Virginia region. I think they go for 65 cents an hour uh, on demand, and obviously cheaper if you do spot instances or reserved instances or anything like that. Um, so for 65 cents an hour, uh, you know, you can actually encode uh, uh, either, you know, sorry, going back to going back to this diagram. Uh, so for 65 cents an hour, you can basically encode two 4K uh, P60s into HEVC, or you know, you can encode eight 1080P. 60s into AVC or HE or HEVC. Um, so when you start comparing that to other instances, like you know, around the same price point, you know, you'd get something like I think like a C5, uh, 2XL or 4XL. I, I forget. But you know, in, in our testing, we found that with X264 faster, we could only actually encode like three channels uh, on the C5 instance at the same price point as as what the VT1 can do eight channels on. Uh, so it's it's quite a bit more, you know optimized and quite a bit more cost effective than you know our, our CPU based instances for uh, for doing kind of this general purpose encoding. So let's dive into a little bit about the uh, what the VQ results look like. Um, so uh, first of all, I apologize that we're using VMAF here and not uh, SIM plus. Uh, you know, we, we didn't have access to that for our testing, but maybe maybe we can change that in the future. <laughs> Um, so, uh, you know, what we did is we, we, uh, we ran VMAF scores, you know, to, uh, uh, with the, uh, with the U30 cards, uh, and compared those to NVENC as well as X264 faster. And you can see, you know, this is a, a UHD AVC encode, um, and you can see the VMAF scores, you know, they're all kind of in the same ballpark. Uh, so, uh, in this case, actually NVENC did a little bit better and then the U60, uh, you know, Came in the middle, and uh, X264 faster was was just uh, just a little bit below, um, but they're all kind of in the same ballpark. So this is why we kind of say that the U30 is is kind of roughly equivalent in in video quality to X264 faster or to the NVENC P4 uh, profile. Similar with uh, uh, with with HEVC, um, you know, in this case we uh, we computed the, the VMAF scores uh, for a uh, for, for the crowd run clip, which I think everyone's probably seen before. Um, and, uh, you know, we saw that in this case, actually, the U30 did uh, kind of 
uh, did, did very well, um, you know, on par with, uh, with NVENC. Uh, and actually, in this case, it kind of did on par with X264, me or, sorry, X265 medium. Uh, but again, you know, we, we still kind of like to say that it's, it's roughly, you know, comparable with faster, because uh, this, uh, this was a little bit of an outlier, most of our testing kind of saw it more, more on par with, uh, with the faster preset. Uh, so how do we how do we work with a VT1? You know how do we how do we use it? Uh, so Xilinx provides a C API if you want to have like low level access to the card's capabilities. They also have some sample C applications in their in their SDK uh, that will show you how to kind of build a basic you know encoder or decoder using using C. Um, they also provide support for FFmpeg. So I think the great majority of people who who are using this are going to end up using FFmpeg. Um, in this case, you know, they, they provide a binary version of, of, of a FFmpeg with kind of all their libraries pre-compiled into it, uh, or you can also build it yourself from source. You know, they provide all of the, uh, uh, all of the libraries that you need to link to and stuff. Um, and this is kind of what the architecture of, of using this card for FFmpeg looks like. So basically, uh, FFmpeg is doing the DMUX in, uh, you know, on the CPU. It then passes, you know, the uh, the frames off to uh, to be decoded, scaled, and encoded on the uh, on the accelerator card, uh, and then they get passed back to FFmpeg for, you know, remuxing on on the other end. So in this case, FFmpeg is is doing, you know, almost nothing on the CPU. Um, but uh, I think to uh, uh, to Chris's point earlier, you know, if you wanted to do that, you know, the, the decoding on the CPU and pass it straight to the scaler or pass it straight to the encoder, uh, you can absolutely do that. Um, and you can also do things like add CPU filters to do image overlays or, or rotations or, you know, whatever, whatever other things you like to do. Um, some important FFmpeg options if you're going to use uh, FFmpeg on one of these new VT1 instances. Uh, so the codec name that you're going to use uh, is mpsoc underscore vcu underscore h264. That's the codec name that they use for uh, for h264. Uh, and then there's also the uh, mpsoc vcu hevc, which is the codec name to use for uh, hevc. So you'd use those codec names for both encode and for decode uh, in your FFmpeg command line. Uh, there's also this uh, Xilinx hardware device flag you can provide. So this is if you're operating in one of these systems that has multiple uh, U30 cards and multiple XCU30 chips that are addressable, uh, you would you can basically on a per job basis specify which card or which chip you want the job to be assigned to. Uh, so that's a way to kind of allocate resources within the system. So that way you can make sure that uh, uh, you know you're 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 packing it as as tightly as possible and actually using all the resources. Um, and then if you want to use the Xilinx hardware scaler to, to create your scaled uh, ABR, uh, you know, this is, you know, you, you use the, uh, the complex filter called multiscale underscore XMA. Um, and I've got a couple of examples here, I think. Um, so if you want to just do, for example, a basic live transcode, uh, it's really simple. You would just do FFmpeg, you know, dash C colon V, you'd provide the decode codec. Uh, in this case, I'm providing, you know, a, a file-based input, but this could be also like a UDP or RTP or RIST or SRT or whatever. Um, and then, uh, you know, you're providing a bit rate and then you're providing the encode codec, which in this case is, is H264 again, and then, you know, the output. Uh, so that's really all you have to do. And by doing that, uh, you know, you're just doing a very simple, you know, H.264 encode, video only, no audio, uh, and you're completely using the accelerator card for both the decode and the encode here. So if you, you know, if you run this encode job and then run top, you'll see that FFmpeg is using like almost none of the CPU because it's really just using it for, you know, for demuxing and muxing. Uh, similarly, if you wanted to do like live transcoding with scaling, you know, this is, uh, this is the FFmpeg command you could use. Uh, so again, this is a bit of a perhaps a bit of an eye chart, but uh, you know, we're using the, uh, uh, the hardware decoder, and then we're using this multi-scale XMA. In this case, we're specifying four outputs. We're creating a 1280, an 848, a 640, and a 288. Um, and uh, you know, in, in this case, we're, we're encoding one of them at you know, the full, say, 60 frame per second frame rate, and then the other two are going to be at the half frame rate, half the source frame rate. Uh, so these would be at, at all 30s. Yeah, go ahead, Chris. Uh, the uh, all audio and other things would be handled on the CPU and not, or is there audio transcode of no. abilities on the FPGA? No, no, no. The, the 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 FPGA and stuff is all video only. So if you do any audio work as part of your uh, as part of your job, then it would all uh, it would all be done in the uh, in the CPU. Okay. Thanks. 
Um, okay, so yeah, this is an example of, of you know, decoding on the, uh, uh, on the FPGA, resizing on the FPGA, and then encoding on the FPGA. So again, this, you know, uses almost no CPU resources to run, to run this job. Um, and then here's a quick example of how you can run, you know, multiple jobs at once. In this case, we're just using Xterm and, and running these commands in the background. Um, but uh, you, you'll notice that we're using this, you know, Xilinx hardware dev uh, command here so that each of these, you know, jobs is going to be allocated to, to a different chip in the system. Uh, so, well, actually, it looks like two of them are going to be running on the same one. Um, but but the idea here is that, like, if, if let's say, for example, you know, you were running... Uh, Eight 1080p 60s, you know, on on that card, like it can handle. Uh, you, you'd you'd want to allocate, say, four of them to one chip and four of them to the other chip. Uh, so so that way, you know, you can take full advantage of all the resources in the system. Uh, and again, you know, there there are tools and SDKs that are provided to help you with that. So you can see the current system loading. You can understand which chips are in use, which chips have free capacity, which ones don't, and and all that sort of stuff. Um, and I believe that Xilinx also has like a reference kind of. Uh, containerized docker based implementation where uh, they kind of have have built like a reference scheduler that will help you kind of decide where to you know where to send resources to based on the current loading of the system um, so we've been doing all this talking about live because the u30 card was really designed primarily for you know real-time performance for live encoding um, however it is possible to use them to get faster than real-time performance um, so one way you can do that is in your FFmpeg command, if you specify dash cores four, uh, what that will do is that will basically allocate all of the resources on a single XCU30 chip to your transcode job. So again, let's say for example, you had a single you know, uh, 1080p60 running on that chip. That chip is capable of doing four 1080p60s. But if you only wanna do one, uh, you can use this dash cores four command and that will basically tell uh, the the uh, the XCU30 to dedicate all of its resources to this one transcode job instead of you know leaving three slots available for you know for future work, um, so that will allow you to get you know almost a 4x speed up if you want to do faster than real time transcoding for file based content. Um, so in this case, you know we were able to achieve uh, about 100 and uh, sorry I guess it's about a 3x speed up. We were able to get about 180 frames per second for uh, 1080p 60 uh, encoding. Um, and then the other thing that uh, that's that's interesting that Xilinx has provided a reference for is using a split and stitch technology, where you can actually take your 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 uh, movie file, split it up into smaller segments, and then transcode them in parallel across all the available uh, X XCU30 uh, chips within the system. Um, so, and with this, uh, you know, by doing that, we were able to achieve the equivalent of about 3,350 frames per second for uh, 1080p 60 encoding on the 24x large. Uh, which has the eight X30 cards, or sorry, that's a that's a typo. That should be U30 cards. Um, that has the eight cards. So basically, uh, in that case, we're taking all of the, uh, uh, I guess, 64 or whatever, you know, 1080p 60 uh, lanes of of encoding capacity on that system, and we're dedicating them all to running the same file-based transcode job at once. Uh, so that's how we're able to get uh, not quite a 64x speed up, but almost, because there is a bit of overhead that's caused by the uh, the splitting and the stitching and the demuxing and the muxing. Uh, so that gets the efficiency down from 64x to something like 57x or something like that. Uh, yeah, Chris, go ahead. Um, when you are running faster than real time, are there uh, quality uh challenges just because of through split and stitch or how I guess the frame gets divided up uh, if, if you're encoding on a single XCU 30 do you see problems just because I guess it's harder to coordinate like look ahead and yeah control? so there are so the one, one of the things that we suggest if you're going to do kind of a split and stitch architecture is that your content has to be uh, long enough that based on the number of splits you're going to do, that each of those splits is some minimum length. I think we recommend at least a few minutes long. Um, the reason being for that is because of A, you know, the overhead of, of, of cutting everything up at some point, you know, the actual transcode time becomes smaller than the than than the overhead of doing all the other stuff. So you know we don't really want that to happen. Um, but but like you said, the, the the main reason for that is because if your segments end up being too small, um, you know, then you end up losing a little bit of quality because you have to close gops, you know, where you wouldn't necessarily have otherwise closed gops and you can't, you know, look ahead quite as far and, and things like that. So you, you lose a little bit of the kind of the, uh, uh, the temporal 
gains that uh, that some of these codecs can give you by uh, uh, by operating over a larger period of time. So you know when you're doing that on you know if you have segments that you're splitting up that are kind of in the you know one minutes, two minutes, three minutes, four minutes, five minutes range, uh, typically that's you, you know the problem becomes pretty pretty minimal because uh, uh, you know most people's GOP boundaries and uh, uh, and and you know reference frames and stuff don't last that long you know anyways uh, so you're basically just telling the encoder you know hey encode this five seconds encode this five minute segment as if it's its own clip and then kind of stitch it to, to the next five minute one. Um, but like like you said, you know, if, if if you were taking a one minute content and splitting it 60 times so that, you know, each piece is one second, then that probably would have a pretty nasty effect on VQ. So I wouldn't recommend that. Thanks. And I think on slide 11, where you see the rate quality curve, those non-uniformities uh, point to some of these Rate quality rate control decisions because they cannot be done in an optimal fashion. So if you look at X264 or X265 rate quality curve, it's very smooth and it's very monotonic. But if you look at NV, Inc. and the other rate quality curve, it's sort of bumpy. And that's the reason why, one of the reasons why it's bumpy. Yep. Um, and the other thing too is that the, uh, You'll notice that the the U30 performs significantly worse at lower bit rates uh, at you know the bottom end of this curve, uh, but keep in mind too that this is UHD AVC that we're testing here. So I would expect pretty much anything you know UHD at four megabits AVC to look pretty bad, uh, but but clearly you know the U30 card is not you know not optimized as well kind of for for doing those you know very very low bit rate uh, uh, encodes compared to some of the other ones. Um, have you done comparisons with Media Convert? Am I supposed to ask that? Uh, we we actually haven't um, because so Media Convert is uh, you know Media Convert is really more intended for those kind of higher quality encode uh, use cases. Uh, you know it's it's used by uh, you know a lot of a lot of you know large scale uh, uh, direct to consumer streaming applications as well as you know studios and broadcasters and those sorts of things so it's you know media convert has done a lot of work to optimize for quality over you know over speed and performance and cost uh, whereas this is kind of the opposite end of the scale you know the the uh, the u30 is really optimized for uh, low cost and high performance uh, you know over over quality and, and features and that sort of stuff um, the reason why I was asking, was the alternative to, to using uh, these uh, high performing instances, would those customers be using FFmpeg or would those customers be using Media Convert? If, they were, if they're going to be using FFmpeg, that makes sense. Otherwise, yeah. those customers may want to know. Yeah, I I would say from from most people who have expressed interest in the VT1 so far have been people who are already using FFmpeg today. Um, and in many cases, they're people who are already using other acceleration mechanisms with FFmpeg. So, you know, they're using NVENC or, uh, uh, or I, I forget what the AMD one is called, um, but, uh, you know, or, or they're using Intel QuickSync on, you know, on, uh, uh, on on-prem uh, transcoding capabilities. Uh, so they're, they're typically people who are already, you know, using kind of whatever tricks are available to them to encode stuff as cheaply as possible. Uh, and really what we're doing here is we're just kind of saying, you know, hey, here's here's another tool in your toolbox that's we think even cheaper than all those other alternatives. Uh, and, you know, you can spin it up and spin it down on demand. So it's, it's a pretty, you know, we think it's a pretty compelling uh, value proposition. Yep, makes sense, got it, thank you. Any other questions? I think that's that's basically the end of my uh, presentation. But uh, you know, if you're interested in learning more, uh, you can go to the uh, EC2 instance type page for the VT1, um, and then Xilinx also has an excellent uh, page on GitHub uh, that has all the uh, the source code and and documentation for their uh, for their SDK. So, if you have any other follow up questions, uh, feel free to uh, hit me up on the video dev Slack, or uh, you can email me at samisb at amazon.com. Thank you very much. Thanks, Brian. Uh, that was a great talk. Uh...
So yeah, no questions. Uh, saw Brian on. Uh, yep. Yeah. Mark, I saw that you unmuted. Yeah. Yourself. Um. Uh, I was curious. Uh, th th thanks. That was a great talk. Uh, uh, do you uh, you mentioned that uh, you know, over the next few months that you're hoping to see features like 10 bit uh, support and other stuff? And I was just curious uh, uh, how you see this evolving over the next few months or years. Like, what kind of features or VQ work? Or like, I guess, what does the roadmap look like for this? Yeah, so I, I can't speak in you know super duper detail about the roadmap. Um, I can tell you that uh, ten bit support is is something that we're looking to add, uh, just because that is a prerequisite for most of the HDR workflows that that people are asking for. Um, so, mm -hmm. you know, there there presumably will be uh, HDR support coming. You know, kind of in, in conjunction with the with the ten bit support. Um, and then the uh, the 4K look ahead is the other one that you know we we publicly can say is is being worked on. Um, and, uh, and and that's going to be coming soon. Um, and then the other thing that uh, that we're working on is that there's still some kind of unused uh, FPGA capacity, you know, for for general for video processing stuff in in the pipeline on the on these cards. Uh, so Xilinx has uh, you know been looking at uh, at also including some additional. Uh, I, I, I'm trying to think of the right word here. Not not like applications, but uh, some additional tooling to allow people to build things like, uh, to do things like compositing and uh, uh, image overlays and, and video rotation and those sorts of things uh, using, you know, using the FPGA accelerator rather than using the CPU. So the, those are other features that may come. Um, and then also, you know, obviously there's there's constantly work being done on, on things like improving VQ, uh, but uh, I, I don't have a whole lot of specifics I can share with you beyond what I already said. Yeah, okay, all right, thanks. Uh, I guess with that being said, um, Brian did uh, mention the video dev Slack, so I just pasted it into the uh, the Google chat. Um, yeah, come and sign up, visit. Uh, Brian's there, I'm there. He, there's a lot of information from for all sorts of different technology topics, HLS, Dash, uh, info about meetups. So feel free to sign up and hope to see you on there. That being said, thanks everyone for coming out. Uh, we have two great talks and uh, see you in a month. Take care. Thanks everyone. Thanks. Thanks.